Hello, and welcome to the premiere episode of Polygamer. My name is Ken Gagne, and I'll be your host. On this show, we'll be looking at issues of equality and diversity in the electronic entertainment industry. We'll be talking with gamers, developers, journalists, advocates, community organizers, and more about the experiences they've had, such as their demographic not being represented in the industry or being misrepresented in gaming media itself. Our goal is to make the industry and the community more inclusive, bigger and broader, and more fun for everybody and to give those listening to the show the opportunity to meet those people that they might not necessarily experience or encounter in their day-to-day lives. The concept for this series began with Anita Sarkeesian's Kickstarter two years ago. When she put up the pitch video for her Feminist Frequency series, Tropes vs. Women in Video Games, I was blown away. I had no idea women were being represented in games in that way. I had never had cause to think about it before. But what happened next really spurred me onto action, which was the threats and harassment she received because of her critical analysis of video games. That was totally uncalled for, no matter whether or not you agree or disagree with her. And once I was aware of these issues, I realized they were happening more often than I realized. Jennifer Hepler, the Bioware writer for Dragon Age 2, received death threats against her family for the script that she wrote. People called for the firing of Carolyn Pettit of GameSpot, because in her glowing review of Grand Theft Auto V, she mentioned some misogyny. Brenda Romero and Darius Kazemi resigned from the IGDA after an inappropriately themed GDC party. George Katamani, the artist behind Dragon's Crown, was not receptive to criticisms of the art style of the women in his game. Capcom received criticism for the game deep down not having any female playable characters, as did Assassin's Creed more recently. And even at PAX East 2013, Tomb Raider cosplayers were harassed. All this despite the ESA saying that 45% of all gamers are women. Hypocrisy such as this was making the rest of us gamers look bad, and I needed to push back. So I did my small part at PAX East, of all places, this past spring, where I assembled and moderated a panel called Sex, Sexy, and Sexism, Fixing Gender Inequality in Gaming. I had an excellent, talented, and diverse panel of industry experts up there on stage with me, and the response was enormous. There were so many more topics than we could address in an hour, so many more people than could fit in the auditorium. We filled it to capacity that I realize that this discussion has to be extended and encompass more than just sexism and feminism. So Polygamer is that space where we can continue the discussion and encompass more of the topics and more members of the community. Now you may be thinking, how am I demographically qualified to be the host of this show? As a privileged, straight, white, cis dude, I've never experienced any of the harassment that we're going to be talking about on this show. Well, that's a question I had, too, going into that panel, and one of my panelists, Tifa Robles, helped me realize what it is that I can contribute to this topic. One is that sometimes marginalized voices, by their very nature, aren't being heard. And so I, as a privileged, white, straight, cis dude and all that, may be heard where other peoples cannot. So I hope to help give those people the same voice that I have. The second is that to expect marginalized voices to fix this problem on their own is neither realistic nor fair. For the large part, this is not a problem created by marginalized voices. And so those of us who are in a position of power have a responsibility to do what we can to fix it, something that I think Spider-Man fans should appreciate. There's also something I selfishly hope to get out of this show. I may be a liberal, open-minded individual willing to change his mind, but one thing I can't change is my background, which is fairly homogenous. I've lived in Massachusetts my entire life, and I probably have biases and prejudices that I'm not even aware of. And I hope to encounter and identify those through the course of this show by putting myself in situations that I find uncomfortable. One of the feedbacks I got from my audience at Paxis, especially the men, was that they want to help, but they're afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing. (laughs) Believe me, when I was up on stage in front of 500 people with cameras rolling, I was afraid of saying and doing the wrong thing. But I did it anyway, and let me keep doing that for you. If you're someone who isn't really sure what to say or do, and you're afraid of offending somebody, just sit back and relax and let me be the awkward one. I've done it my whole life, and I'm happy to continue doing it. I will create this safe space not only for other voices to be heard, but for me to ask questions and brush up against topics that I might not otherwise encounter, so that you can do this through me. To that end, I want this to be a community outlet. And so comments on this video have been enabled. Comments on my blog post have been enabled. And if you go to my blog, you can even send voicemail that will play back on this show. Now, this may be optimistic of me, and if these outlets are abused, then I will have to reconsider that approach. But for now, that's how it's going to work. 
However, this is an uncensored show. People will be using language appropriate to the topic. And so it does have an explicit tag in iTunes. If you want to listen to the audio-only version, you can find it there. And I will try to be sensitive about putting up a trigger warning when appropriate as well for those episodes that call for it. So with all that out of the way, I look forward to bringing you great discussions and interviews on these topics the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. Please subscribe to YouTube channel GameBits or to Polygamer in iTunes to make sure you get all the future episodes. But for now, let's kick it off with an interview with Mr. Matt Kahn of the convention Gamer X. I can think of no finer a guest to join me for the premier episode of the Polygamer podcast than Mr. Matt Kahn. Matt is the CEO of Midboss, which is producing the game Read Only Memories. He is the founder of Gamer X, the second annual gay gamer convention occurring in San Francisco. July 10th to the 13th, more details at GamerX.com, and he's executive producer of the documentary Gaming in Color. Hello, Matt. Hey, how you doing? I'm excellent, sir. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me on the first episode of this of this new endeavor. I'm so excited. Oh, my pleasure. I'm sorry that you couldn't have a, a full computer. I understand you had a few technical issues joining the chat today. Yeah, uh, I spilled some water on my MacBook, and so I'm currently living off of uh, my cell phone, which is... Um, Surprisingly harder to do a lot of you can't really work on unity on your cell phone. Uh, I'm learning so um, wait, I'm eager to get my computer back <laughs> Well, as long as you're not on deadline just consider it a vacation uh, Well, you know, I'm actually going to the White House next week And I don't know if I'm gonna have my computer by then and I'm kind of that's my my big panic attack of the week Wow, um, um, what's bringing you to the White House? Well, actually, the Obama administration, they are holding a uh, basically an LGBT tech summit to kind of talk about ways to improve kind of uh, getting more queer people into technology and ways that we can kind of make uh, corporations more queer friendly and support LGBT culture. Um, and so since we're kind of the only people doing it in the gaming world, um, that was kind of our, our ticket in. Wow. Will this be your first time meeting a president? Um, I actually met him a couple years ago at a fundraiser, but just like, in a, I don't even know how I got in. I don't know why I got in the front row and well, I probably shouldn't have even been there. So this is my first time legitimately meeting a president. Wow. Congratulations, sir. I hope it goes well. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about your background. You are a lifelong gamer. Oh yeah. That was, uh, my, my whole thing. My sister had a best friend and I think she wrote something in her yearbook or something that was like, we'll be best friends forever or until Matt stops playing video games or stops liking video games. And, um, you know, as a kid, that, that was my entire medium. Um, from NES up, just, you know, I was, that was my whole thing. <laughs> What's your favorite console? <sighs> favorite console? Uh, shoot. Uh, I would probably say Super Nintendo just because there's the most games that I played on there that looking back were really the best games of, of my like childhood. Um, I don't think that there was, you know, Super Nintendo had Earthbound and Super Mario RPG and Mario Kart and Super Mario World and, um, you know, just all these, these kind of really weird games um, that, that really just Genesis didn't have. Sorry. Uh, and, um, yeah, so Super Nintendo really, really was, I think, the game system that took it to the next level. Yeah, that's where all the franchises that we're playing nowadays really started. I mean, I just finished playing Mario Kart 8, and it's it's fantastic, except for the battle mode. Oh, yeah. How did they screw that up so badly? I mean, geez, they should just not put battle mode in there at all. If you're just going to have a course, uh, that is, that's very sad, because I, I hadn't played a battle mode since Super Nintendo, but that one was really unique and fun, and you know, it just shows how important level design is, because mm -hmm. the battle mode is so unplayable in Mario Kart 8, because that levels are not designed for battles. I absolutely agree, sir. So let's talk a little bit about GamerX. This uh, event was first held in 2013 after a successful Kickstarter event on tw in 2012. What prompted you to organize this event? Um, so uh, I was previously working at a tech startup, and I, you know, my entire life getting up until that point, I knew I was a gay and a geek, and I kind of kept my life very separate. Um, for the most part, you know, that was because being a geek has its own stigmas and you kind of are, are sort of already an outsider. and People look down on you and you kind of feel like, you know, at least in high school, it's like, oh, all the cool kids are jocks or this or that. And you know, being a geek, you feel very kind of alone. And then 
you know, I'm, I was smart enough to realize that being gay and also being a geek would really pretty much isolate me to having no friends. And um, it, 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 was, it wasn't until, you know, I was like 21, 22 where I was, you know, at a tech company and I was still separating my, my geeky life and my gay life. And I was like, this, this isn't working for me. Like, I, I, I don't feel like I, I can't be living like two lives, like side by side. Um, and it was when I started finding like websites like GayGamer.net and Reddit Gamers. And I found out that there's actually tens of thousands of other gay geeks who actually feel very similarly where they kind of reject mainstream gay culture and they don't really identify with it. And they feel like they've been rejected by mainstream gay culture. But at the same time, they feel like when they go to places like PAX or at E3 or any any big major gaming convention or, or things, that it's not made for them. It's made for, for hetero males. And they feel like there is really no voice for them in the community and that when they play games, there's no one there that represents them. There's no one that they can relate to. And I think for gaming, which I think is, you know, anyone who's, who takes gaming seriously, we look at it as an art and it's an art form. It's a media. And if you're telling us that this media, which is the largest selling media um, um, platform, you know, larger than TV and movies and, and music all combined, if it's not able to explore sexuality and diversity and gender and all these different things, it's hard to really be able to paint a really awesome picture with only a few colors. And so I think that for games to be taken as serious pieces of art, they have to be able to incorporate these things. And it's important for young people because they can see that there are you know, queer characters in games and be able to identify with them. And for straight people to see that queer people are just like them and they can play alongside them and you know, have those positive experiences. So some of what you talked about, about the intersection of being a geek and being gay, isolating you, addresses one of the questions I had when I first saw the Kickstarter. Now, full disclosure, I did back both Kickstarters. You can see my name on the website under the list of donors. But when I first saw the Kickstarter, I didn't understand why there was an intersection for uh, being gay and being a gamer. I mean, I don't see conventions for other demographics being intersected, like Jewish gamers or vegetarian gamers. So why is there a need for this intersection to be identified with its own event. Sure. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one is, is community where I think that for a lot of gay geeks, if you, I mean, so I think that with community in terms of, if you are a gay person, obviously you're just looking to, you know, hook up with other people in your gender. Um, and the gay community as a whole really rejects kind of geek culture. And if you are a geek, people will, I mean, I remember as a kid, I would be on these like kind of dating -y kind of hookup sites and people would numerous times be like, oh, you're a cop. You're a cop. You don't speak like a gay person. And I was like, what? Like, no, I just, what? And it, I just felt like, you know, growing up, you know, there's a very specific stereotype that, that gay people are held to. And they kind of, there's like a self-fulfilling prophecy there. And for gay geeky people, they kind of get shoved out. And so we wanted to make a safe space where queer people could get together and just hang out with other people who are like them and have similar interests. Um, so that's number one. And then I think that, you know, and I think that's very relatable to a lot of people, but I think that a lot of other people, you know, they may look at it and say, Oh, I don't understand this. I don't understand the intersectionality. But, um, what I think that people don't understand is, is it's a very kind of nuanced issue where, you know, if you are either whether you're a female or you're a gay person, or even if you're a person of color, you're playing games, the, your entire game experience over the last 30 years, you've been playing as characters that don't represent you. 99% uh, of games are white male, you know, straight leads. And we have been forced to accept that, you know, we're playing this other, this other thing. And I think that for a lot of people, they want to see themselves represented in games. Um, you know, I, remember how very vividly any anytime there's characters that show up in games that have queer storylines and it's very rare and it makes me feel actually very even when it's poorly handled even like in, in stuff like persona 4 um it still makes you feel like recognized it makes you feel like these game creators understand that you're out there and that you exist and that you know it, it validates your existence and i think it's important in the same way um as you know queer film festivals are and that you know, there's a lot of really awesome queer folks who are presenting stories from different angles or they're including queer characters in meaningful ways. And I think it's important that we celebrate that and kind of talk about ways that we can 
continue to make weird, awesome games that include people and, and make everybody feel welcome at the table. Um, the other, you know, side of it is even if you don't really get into that or, you know, you're totally straight dude and, you know, this isn't really your thing, I think that what's important is that people understand that it's actually very good for the gaming economy as a whole. And the reason for that is, yes, you may see more games with women or queer characters. No one's going to ever force you to play those games. You know, you know, you'll always have your shooty shoot games. No one's ever going to take those away from you. But the more women and queer people and people of color and people who have felt disenfranchised feel welcome into the community and feel like they're safe playing online and they're not going to be harassed and this or that, they're going to spend more money in in-app purchases. They're going to buy more games. They're going to be more involved in the, in the community. That means they're going to spend more money, and that means there's going to be more money in the gaming industry for everybody. So it's actually in everyone's best interest. Whether, you know, like if you're just like a straight-up Republican, it's in, it's in the best monetary interest of everyone to have as many people involved in gaming, feeling happy, feeling included, because they will spend more money. And I think that that's like the, the, like the baseline. If, if you can't get down with like the social elements of it, it's just good for the bottom line. So is this an industry that would benefit from, from having a female gamer convention or a Hispanic gamer convention? Um, I definitely think for sure. Uh, so well, one of the interesting things about our convention is last year we had about 30 to 35 uh, percent non-male attendees, whether it be female or trans or, or, or just something they don't identify as, as male. Uh, this year we have about 50 percent. And I think that's really telling where, you know, we have speakers like Carolyn Petite, uh, Carolyn Petit, uh, Pettit, Pettit, I'm sorry, uh, who, um, who writes for GameSpot, who she got like all these like death threats and stuff after she gave Grand Theft Auto a nine because she mentioned there were some, you know, misogynistic elements of it. And we have Anita Sarkeesian speaking and all these people who, you know, they don't necessarily feel comfortable at other, other conventions. And so I definitely think that there's a very large audience for females uh, out there. I think in the same way, I think there's definitely an audience for queer and people of color. Um, but obviously, queer people and people of color don't make up half the population, and they don't make up about half the gaming landscape. So I definitely think that there is space for uh, more inclusive uh, events for women and making events that specifically talk about women's issues and, and kind of diversity around that um, in general. And so that's one of the things that we're actually starting to move towards is, this year we have kind of an entire uh, feminism track at GamerX, and probably moving forward, um, you know, we've announced in the past that this is going to be our last uh, event as GamerX, but we're looking at in the future, how can we make this more diverse? How can we make it something that is not about just being like, hey, let's talk about LGBT, but how can we talk about anyone who's feeling disenfranchised, and how can we make sure that their voices are being heard? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that it probably wouldn't make as much sense for something like, um, Hispanic or, or, or whatever. I mean, uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's important in that, it, that their stories are being told and that they are encouraged to be involved and encouraged to be developing games and stuff. But there's also with, um, with our events specifically with LGBT is that people, that there's the, the element of wanting to find companionship and that's something where there's there's that weird intersectionality that you wouldn't necessarily find at a uh, women's or or um, you know a people of color uh, event like there isn't that that built in kind of oh by the way like I can maybe find a lover or something so that's an added bonus of it being an LGBT kind of focused event. So who is your target audience then? I mean you you talk about looking for companionship, but that implies a very narrow demographic of you know single gay individuals. Totally. I mean, the, the demographic is definitely everybody. I think that, like, when you look at, um, like I said, like a film festival, um, that, that, you know, like an LGBT film festival, you see kind of people from all walks of life go to it, but more predominantly, it's, it's queer people because those, are, like, it's, it's telling their stories and, you know, their friends are in it or whatever. So, you, know, you see more queer people at the queer film festival. You see everybody coming to kind of appreciate or celebrate or discuss these different topics. And I think in the same way, um, you know, we're having all these different things at our convention that um, I would think that if you were a straight dude or, or someone who wasn't really that involved in the LGBT community, I still think there's a lot of really interesting stories and academic, academic stuff to our convention 
that is, I think is just super fascinating. You know, um, we have David Gator, who's like the head writer of uh, Dragon Age for Bioware. And so he's going to be speaking about, you know, kind of why he got queer characters in Dragon Age and kind of how that's advancing with the new Dragon Age games. We have WWE's Darren Young. He talked about being the first openly gay pro wrestler, being an openly gay person of color and being a pro wrestler and what that's been like and kind of the backlash that he's faced. Um, different people like that where there's actually like really kind of fascinating, you know, uh, topics behind it. And I think it's actually a really good opportunity for people to learn and, and be able to kind of understand this community better. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we have 2K and Unity and Ubisoft and Ouya and, you know, Riot Games, who does League of Legends and all these different, and like, they're not going to talk about like, you know, they, they don't have a lot of queer stuff to talk about. I think they're just going to be talking about, here's our games under the kind of the, the more of a guise of like, we want this to be inclusive of everybody. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be really gay or anything. It's just a um, – we're talking about our games, but it's in a safe space. And, you know, the, that's kind of the whole vibe of our, our convention. And, and I, I think that's kind of, you know, one of our, our big kind of tenets is, like, we don't want to be that much different than other conventions. Like, we have a video game rooms and card rooms, and it's, it's, it's a lot very much like other gaming conventions. But we make sure to train our staff, you know, on, on making sure that – they use proper gender pronouns and, you know, they understand kind of the different potential, you know, sore spots of, of areas where they should make sure they understand how to be, um, uh, understand, like, I guess, make, you know, make a diverse, safe space and how to create that space. And that's something that we really want to focus on and, and make sure that we separate ourselves uh, from other conventions in that, but also hopefully inspire uh, other conventions and spaces to be like, look, we have like not a ton of money and we're able to do it. You guys should be able to do it too. Now I understand that events like this, you know, they create that safe space. They create the opportunity for a marginalized group to have a voice. But at the same time, there are these other events like, you know, E3, GDC, PAX. I went to PAX East a few months ago and moderated a panel on feminism and gaming. Some people thought I was a hypocrite for doing that at PAX of all places. But the reason I chose that outlet is because I felt based on PAX's history, that was exactly the environment that needed to hear that message. And I didn't want to be preaching to the choir. So ideally, shouldn't we have these, you know, safe spaces at somewhere like PAX? Shouldn't we be integrating all these different communities? Oh, totally. I mean, I think though it's, it's you know, part of it is not necessarily conventions like PAX or E3's fault. I think a lot of it is also just the gaming culture in general where it is in, you know, most people, I mean, 99.9% .9 of people are good people. People don't want to discriminate against other people. A lot of it is just lack of understanding. And I think that, you know, the more that people, like, I mean, it's, it's, it, let's just say that video games existed 50 years ago, there were probably segregation at these things. But, you know, we moved on from that. And in the same way, within 10, 20 years, no one's going to give a shit about if someone's queer or gay or lesbian because it just shouldn't fucking matter. And things like GamerX, at the end of the day, they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't need to exist. I mean, there's a reason why in San Francisco, gay bars are going out of business. It's because people in San Francisco feel safe. If I were to go to a bar in the, in the mission, or I was going to go to any bar, and I would hit on you, and you're straight or whatever, you, I, I would not feel like, you're, like my life would be a danger, or that you would beat me up. I would, you would just be like, oh, yeah, I'm not gay, or whatever. Done. Everyone's happy. That's not the same thing across the world. In a lot of places, you can be put to death, or you could. It's just it's or it's just a really not a safe space if you're queer, and so that's really where we want to get to. Where GamerX, as a theory, is is silly because there really shouldn't need to be a safe space and a separate space. But from the stories that we get and the people that we talk to, so many of them are either. I mean, we've had a lot of high level executives at game companies who are like, I can't come out or they're closeted because they're scared of losing their jobs. People who they live in the middle of nowhere and they're afraid that they're going to, you know, like they'll lose their friends or their family will, you know, is religious. So they'll stop like loving them. And there's all these people who have like these awful, like they, they just want to be able to be around other people who are like them. And also and these people are like, it's video games first. Like they want to be around people who, who are, who understand their, their, the, the issue of being gay but also can talk about Mega Man or this or that, uh, and which is really tough. You go to Pride, nobody wants to talk about Mega Man. They're 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 doing off to whatever. So it's very rare to find people who share your common interests in games, 
and also uh, can kind of share the same kind of issues and topics and, and be a good kind of um, um, sounding board to talk about your, your issues and, and kind of grow and, and have these discussions with. So you mentioned that you have a lot of different groups coming in, like Ubisoft and the like. Have you had any challenges getting corporate sponsors because of the nature of this event? Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Um, in the first year, it was uh, something that I, I chalked up, honestly, to. It was our first year. Nobody knew who we were. We're coming out of nowhere. Um, I think that a lot of people didn't know what to expect with the event. And so when we would get rejections from you know, all these different companies, whether it be Sony or this or wherever, uh, a lot of times they'd be very like, well, come back to us next year. Like, you know, we like, and, and, and that makes total sense. Like if I were a giant corporation, I wouldn't just throw money at this random thing because you don't know what it's going to be like. But we proved that, you know, we sold out the place. We had 2,300 people. Press was, you know, from, you know, from Vice to Forbes to, you know, just like everywhere. And it proved to be a monumental success in terms of the press and the, and the attention it got. And so we came back the next year and we're like, okay, cool. So now you know this is worth it. We're not asking a lot of money. This is a really good ROI for you. And then all of a sudden, all these companies now, then they start pussyfooting into like, oh, well, you know, we don't want to make a political statement. Like, that's the kind of like, like that's like Nintendo or Razor or all these different companies that are like big fucking pussies because they don't, they're afraid that they're going to lose their user base and they're afraid that they're going to lose people, you know, who are not going to buy their games because they support queer rights. And you know what? You're going to be on the losing end of things and you're going to lose money. And at the end of the day, you're going to become irrelevant because you can't grow up and get with the times. So like, you know, Razor flat out is just run by a bunch of homophobes. And there's a million other companies I can tell you that are just run by just, just total dickheads. And there's a bunch of other companies that are awesome and really want to do cool stuff. And, you know, like for all the shit that Ubisoft got about women in, in Assassin's Creed and like, yeah, that's an issue. I know that Ubisoft had employees, a lot of really awesome people who are not just queer, just regular people who, like, their culture is around tolerance and acceptance and diversity, and, like, doesn't, like, yeah, that one game made that one choice, but the people there actually want to do good, and a lot of them, they fight hard, I mean, like, it's tough, and I understand, I run a business, and I understand that, like, it's very hard to be like, hey, we're going to take this $50 million franchise, and just all of a sudden just start throwing all this gay shit in it. Or, or this or that, like, that's not the way the world works. And I understand that. But these companies, whether it be, I mean, even if it's a company like EA, which is EA, or it's, you know, a company that everyone loves, like, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not, Ubisoft's obviously not universally loved. I'm trying to think of some of this, every, pretty, there's very rarely any universally loved video game companies any these days. But it doesn't matter the company. A lot of these companies want to do it. A lot of them are honestly afraid of, you know, taking that first step. They know they want to do it, um, as opposed to the Nintendos of the world, where they honestly are just like, they they have no intention. They have no like they they, you know, they have no intention of of, of wanting to get towards that because that's not their culture. They don't care about queer people. They just want to avoid when PR shit goes down, like the Tamodachi life, and. You know, and then then they have to you know do their 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 safety dance back. Um, so it was kind of interesting seeing like if this year, who was willing to step up and be like, yeah, okay, like you guys aren't asking a lot of money, you have a lot of press behind you, like we want to be involved in it. And which ones were like, yeah, I don't think we can get anyone in Japan to go for it, or yeah, we don't want to make a political statement, or yeah, you know. Or worse, you know, and it's those companies that are just like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not like they didn't have the money. It's not like they didn't see the ROI on it. It was that someone up top is a bigot and they're not willing to take a chance. And do you think that's a, do you think that's a cultural thing based on where these companies are located, like United States versus Japan or even parts of the United States? For example, I'm here in Boston. We have a ton of great game companies right here, like 2K or we used to, are you noticing any correlation between where the companies are and how supportive they are? Totally, yeah. I mean, when you look at, like, I mean, like, 2K is one of our sponsors this year, and part of that is that, you know, the people that we've been directly interfacing with have either been queer or super queer friendly, 
and that's important because they hire diverse people. And that's what happens when you hire diverse people is that you get diverse opinions and you get people like, hey, we should support this event or that. If you hire just a bunch of, and there's, again, there's nothing, I think this is one of the biggest um, issues when people kind of talk about privilege or this or that. I'm a, I'm a white male, you're a white male. There's nothing wrong with being a white male or being a straight white male. Like there's nothing wrong with it. It is not, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but you look at like this, the cases that, like the Supreme Court case that got handed down this week, we have men voting on the rights of women. Where if you don't have women, you don't have a diverse panel there, how can you, ex you know, expect there to be an actual real dialogue? I think in the same way, when dev teams are composed of just white males, or they're composed of just you know, straight white males or whatever, then you're not getting this diverse you know, hive mind. Instead, you're getting a very one particular worldview, which there's nothing wrong with. And there's nothing wrong with those people. But by having diversity and having a you know, very wide swath of people, you're able to kind of be like, oh, well, hey, maybe these type of people will feel this way or might be offended by this or that. If anything, it helps make the game more diverse and more fun and also helps you avoid potential PR nightmares when shit you know, goes down and you're like, oh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't know that gays would want to marry one another in Tomodachi life. Who would have known? Because like, that's what happens because I'm sure they have no openly gay employees at Nintendo of Japan. I, mean, no, I know gay ones at NOA, but you know, when, I, when I was talking to the NOA employees at E3, they were all like super closeted. They had to be like, oh, yeah, I'm family. They can't even be out openly gay at NOA. I mean, they can. I mean, you know, I'm sure that they can be, but it's one of those like cultural, like you know, you want to make it in this industry, you might want to hold that back a little bit, kid. And then, you know what? And that's bullshit. <laughs> that shouldn't be the way it is, and it is. And uh, I want that to stop. <laughs> so that's how the corporations have responded to GamerX. What about the public, especially since you got Kickstarter funding? As Anita Sarkeesian discovered, that can open you up to just all kinds of criticism. When you announced that there was going to be a gay gamer convention, how do people respond? Um, you know, it's a, it's a range of things. I mean, there's definitely like the people who are just like, I hate gays. Gays are stupid, and those are like that's funny because you know there's no there's no convincing those people, and they don't even understand. They just are like, oh, this is a gay thing. So, you know, I just cut that out. And there's people who support it, which is really awesome. And there's people who support it but are critical of it, and they actually helped us really shape you know, it from being something that was, I think when I first created it, it was very much more about like, I think gay dudes in my head, just because I am a gay dude and that's what I prefer. Um, and as I formed a more diverse team of now we have, you know, everyone from straight dudes to women, to trans and folks to gender queer folks on our team, our con has really grown to figuring out how we can make it safe spaces for everyone and has really evolved. Um, I think that as we created it and as we launched it, there was a very, you know, um, I think reasonable middle ground where if I were to hear this as a young person before I had kind of been openly gay, um, or if I was a straight person, I would legitimately ask, why is this necessary? And why, why is this not segregation? Because this, it seems like self-segregation. And, you know, and, and that's like the comments that we get all the time. But what's very telling about that is that the only people that are calling it segregation are straight folks. There's no gay people who are like, hey, like we're self-segregating here. Let's not do this. Because at the end of the day, if we were like, it's all about perspective. Where if we were getting, you know, an equal share of games, where we were in, let's say 5% of every game had a, had a queer character. And we already were getting a fair share. And it was a very kind of like, you know, the, the community was already there. And then and then we're like, oh, by the way, we're going to have this gay only conference and straights aren't allowed and it's a gay thing. Then, yeah, that would be super problematic and that'd be stupid. And that would be like very harmful to the community. But this is just a like, hey, nobody talks about gay rights in, in games at all. There's no safe spaces for that. No one like a lot of people I know, like when you talk to them, they talk about how they feel very uncomfortable about all of these things. Let's make a safe space for them. It's totally not exclusionary. I know the name is like, it implies that it is, and that's part of the reason why we're ditching the name after this year, because we don't want people to feel that way. We don't want anyone to feel like, I've had so many awesome allies who are like, I want to come, this sounds awesome, but I don't want to intrude on your safe space. And I'm like, no, I, like, I know the name, it, it, the name is really kind of throws people off. 
it was cool because it got us a lot of attention because it's just a stupid play on words. But it's it's not about that. It's not about, you know, us versus them. It's about, hey, you know, a bunch of people who usually get treated like shit having a really awesome, you know, safe, fun time that's directed directly towards their interests. So it sounds like GamerX has been successful. It has created that safe space. There hasn't been a lot of trouble. No, I mean, you know, like, obviously there's there's no um, accounting for, to, you know, personal actions. But um, last year we had, like, you know, one incident, and that was just, like, someone getting really fucked up. Um, like, no, there was no fights. There was no, like, like, people, like, people were very respectful to one another. And, and a lot of that is about, you know, training folks and, and making sure that they understand, like, hey, like, this is the way we ask that we expect you to treat one another while you're here. If you don't understand things, like try to like before just immediately jump to conclusions, try to understand their point of view and try to come at it with like a, a you know, with respect. And, um, you know, we have things like gender pronoun uh, like badges this year and like we have gender neutral bathrooms, and just small things were like to you and me, like if there's a gender neutral bathroom, it's like, cool, whatever. It's a bathroom. Like I don't give a shit. But to, to people who are trans or feel uncomfortable, maybe going into the other bathroom, but feel like they. Like let's say you're a, you're a trans woman and you know you're afraid to to use the women's room because it's like oh we, you know we don't want a man in here but then you also want to use the men's room because you feel like you're going against your identity it's very like troublesome it's like oh like you shouldn't have to have to think about that when you're on vacation at a gaming convention you should be able to have fun and not have to think about it so we're creating that safe space where they can just be like cool gender neutral bathrooms great and for me and you that's no extra like inconvenience and I think that's like that's what our our whole thing is about is like how can we do these really small things that don't really cost anything and make make it so much better for all these people who are, get treated like crap everywhere else? Oh, sorry. You mentioned you mentioned you had about twenty three hundred people attend last year. What are you expecting for a turnout this year? Um, I think that we're looking at around twenty five hundred. Um, part of the reason for I mean, we definitely were hoping to get around thirty five hundred this year. But part of the reason why uh, it's not jumping up kind of uh, hugely is because we basically have exhausted all of our options in San Francisco. Uh, we did it at the Hotel Kabuki last year, and we definitely, like, the place was way too packed. Like, it was just, just like, grossly overpacked. And so we knew that we had to move if we were going to even have that amount of people again. And there was about five hotels downtown that were within – our price range and had had more space, um, and the Intercontinental is a place that is uh, has that space, but comes with a very high price tag. And because of that, we had to raise our ticket prices quite a bit. And on top of that, the hotel is just extremely expensive, even with the con rate, um, which sucks because we don't see any of that money at all. It all goes to the hotel, um, but it, it it prices a lot of people out. And at the end of this, like I, I actually feel really gross about that because I don't want people like the people who really deserve to come. And, and would benefit the most from it, they shouldn't not be able to come because they can't afford it. And it sucks that, you know, it definitely did price a lot of people out this year. And so one of the things that we want to figure out moving forward after this year is like, how do we do this on a more scalable event? You know, like, is it working with partner organizations to let us use their space so that way we don't have to pass the price along to, to people? Or, you know, working with more nonprofits. Like this year we donated 100 badges to Geeks Out, work with like low income geeks and stuff. but it's still not like at the end of the day, it's still, if you can kind of afford it, it's like a thousand dollars to fly to San Francisco and that's a thousand dollars for the hotel. I mean, that's even right before you get a ticket. And it's just, I, I don't, I want to figure out a way to make this more global, more universal. Like it shouldn't just be a safe space for people who live in San Francisco who already have the most safe space in the world right now, honestly. Um, I want to figure out ways to extend these resources beyond just here. Um, so that's part of the reason why we're kind of like we announced after this year that we're kind of gonna, we're going to step back, see how this career goes, and then figure out ways that we can do this moving forward in, in ways that are um, more more scalable and more global. So hey, you know, do oh, well, well as, as, if I recall or if I understand correctly, that's one of the differences between GamerX and event, an event like PAX East. PAX East is organized by a company that does this for a living and they do it for profit. And it sounds like GamerX is entirely volunteer run. Um, yeah, and you know, it is. It, it we're not a registered nonprofit. Um, 
And that's not uh, we we definitely tried to like we we hoped and we're hoping that we were hoping that we would be able to make at least some money. Um, but at the at the current moment, I mean, we're, we we lost money on year one, and we're probably not going to make. We're probably still going to lose money on on this year. But it's okay. Like at the end of the day, we we made enough that we could hold the event, and you know, I think that everybody who volunteered their time, they did so happily. I mean, I even though I left my job to do this and I don't pay myself anything. I'm happy that I'm doing this. Like this is exactly what I want to be doing. Like I, I love video games. I love queer stuff. I, you know, I, I can't, I can't lie and say like, this has also put me in a really awesome position in the games industry. And like, it's, it certainly has helped me on, in my personal life too. Uh, but I'm cool with the fact of that, like we're not, that we're not making money. Like it's very, very hard to run a convention and, People who run packs, um, you know, obviously there's been some PR stuff that's happened, but the way that they run their their, their their conventions, they know what they're doing and they're making money because they're a very slick, well-oiled machine. We are not a well-slicked, oiled machine. We are a very disorganized group of well-intentioned people, and we try to make this event be as awesome as as possible, but half the time we have no idea what the fuck we're doing. We're just like, you know, we're like, okay, what is the best thing to do here? And we put our brains together and we figure it out. But last year we made a ton of mistakes and we learned from it. But those mistakes ended up costing us a lot of money. Like our Kickstarter money probably could have paid for everything and given us a little bit of money if we had been smart about how we spent it. But we had no idea. We were like, oh shit, we got to get insurance and it's like two weeks out. So we got to pay like super high rates and this and that. And people breaking, con like we just didn't understand all these things. And the hotel all of a sudden sticks us for eight grand here. Just these stupid little tiny things. And it's just things that like, after doing it the first year, we're like, oh, duh, like probably should have this thing. Like it just, it, it's, it's one of the things that like very few conventions make money in the first few years. And that's why a lot of them then fizzle out very quickly is because, you know, if you don't have a cash reserve, you don't have, you know, uh, uh, it's very, you, you're going to lose money until you, you turn it around. And so that's why PAX had that advantage of having successful other best business entities as it got off the ground in the same way. If we weren't doing wrong, if we weren't like you know actively involved with that and 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 kind of doing that Kickstarter, we probably wouldn't have enough cash to even have put on this convention this year. Even though we did the Kickstarter this year, that was just for the deposit. The entire venue is up is almost a hundred grand. So, uh, you know, we're we're still even to the to right now. I'm looking at it. I'm like, I'm trying to make sure that we don't lose more than ten grand. It's like just working on, you know, all the numbers. And it's, it's scary because I know for a fact there's no way we're going to make a profit. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with if, if we could have made a profit, that's awesome. But um, it's, you know, it is what it is. I, and I think that, that what the work that we're doing is more meaningful. And um, it certainly has set, up, set us up in an interesting position to do other things like work on our game or do other projects um, in the gaming industry. So, um, it's definitely not, not like the end of the world. It's not like we're, we're, you know, going to lose our house or well, not that we have a house, but I don't know. <laughs> now you talk about, you know, I'm sure you'll make new mistakes this year and you'll learn from those and you'll correct them. But I've read some headlines that say that this is the last gamer X. Now from having spoken to you the last hour, it sounds like the event will continue, but maybe under a different name. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple, a couple of reasons why we announced it. Um, one is, you know, definitely we were, especially at the beginning of the year, we're not get, we were not getting the corporate sponsorship that we needed at all, and it was it was looking very bleak. And, and up until this last month, um, it was it was looking really bleak. And, and then all of a sudden, Riot and 2K and Ubisoft and NIS America and Unity and all these different companies all of a sudden just came on, and it was great. And now we're like, okay, like we're starting to just barely get there, um, but it's still like cutting it way too close. And I think that. Um, you know, we've asked a lot of our volunteers over the last couple, you know, the last two years, and we want to make sure that before we take another leap forward, that you know, we know what we're doing, that we're, what we're getting into, what the potential liabilities are going to be, um, and also I think that you know, when you look at how many women are attending our conference, and I, and I, how many awesome straight allies who wanted to come or think it's a cool idea but are not coming because they don't think it's for them or they think that they might be intruding on a safe space or they don't know what to expect. Uh, it makes me sad because I, I want, I want this to be something for everybody. I want it to be a, a, a specific experience that is about, you know, 
making everyone feel comfortable and happy, that means everybody. That means if you're an ally, if you're female, if you're trans, you're genderqueer, asexual, whatever the fuck you are, it doesn't matter who you are. You're a gamer first, and we respect one another, and we're, and we're down to like have these discussions about how we can make gaming better for everybody. Um, and so we're looking at how what that might look like. So is that making it everyone games and doing a, a, a you know a yearly convention around that? Uh, is it doing maybe one day events like maybe one here and one in New York and one in London? Is it about maybe doing like a game jam or a hackathon and doing different stuff, but around like LGBT themes? So that way we get people talking about it. Is it going to do speeches? Maybe like going to not like not Don, Naughty Dog does it great. But like going to these different gaming companies and be like, hey, here's been our experience. Here's some really awesome game developers like Maddie Bryce and and you know and and Colleen Macklin and you know we can kind of present a little like presentation and show them like here's why it's important that you start thinking about diversity in your games. So there's a lot of different ways that we can go. And, and honestly, we want to figure out the things that are going to be the most scalable for getting our message out there. Um, at the end of the day, you know, because we're not making money, it's going to be about making sure that we, we make the most out of the time that we're spending on this. Um, and that we're, you know, we're creating the, the most good out of our time. And so that's why I'm really excited about our game that we're working on, because unlike the convention, which if you live in the city, it's still 70 bucks. If you live from outside the city, it's like $2,000 or whatever, some crazy amount to, to come. With our game, it's $10. And it's a game that is going to be a legitimately awesome game and super fun, but features queer characters in it in a way that isn't going to be like in your face or like, you know, it's not going to be like, you, you're not going to walk away being like, oh, that was a really gay game and I felt uncomfortable playing it. But instead, you're like, oh, I got to meet some really interesting characters, some of which were kind of weird, and I don't know, I didn't know how to interact with them, but I learned a little bit about them and, and come away, like, kind of feeling a little bit better about kind of, you know, understanding these different these different characters. So, like, whether it be, like, you know, we have a gender queer character, and we have trans characters, and we have this and that in the game, and they're not, like, overt, and they're not, like, they don't just, the second you meet them, they're not like, hey, I'm a gay guy, good, good, good. But, you know, if you really get into talking to them, like, they might reveal stuff about themselves, and they certainly, just because they're queer, they don't make them good people. They all have their own motivations and their own things, and there's a lot of very, uh, you know, evil people in this in this new world. But and, and honestly, their gender and sexuality has nothing to do with it. It's, you know, their moral code is not tied at all to gender and sexuality. And I think that's another important thing is that um, – as we move forward with these rights and, and you know, we, we move to a more, you know, equal world, we also can't overlook the fact that, like, just because someone's queer doesn't necessarily also make them a good person either. Um, every People are people no matter what. Um, and so I think that it's, it's important that we look at everyone individually and, and appreciate everyone for who they are as well as um, understand that, it's not a black and white thing where it's like it's not gay, it's not all gay people are evil or all gay people are good. It's just gay people are, have a specific sexual preference and then whatever. And then they're humans. So this ties a little bit actually into the question I had about why have a convention for gay gamers. You just said that in Read Only Memories, the game that you're developing, that you have all these LBGT characters, but that their sexuality is almost irrelevant. So what, why even bother having that detail in the game if it doesn't matter? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I guess, like, think about the Mario, for instance, you know, where it's like, it is not implied. It is obviously very clear that he is heterosexual because he's going after a woman. And with almost every game, it is always implied or it is inferred that they are heterosexual. And so it's important that people just see that queer people exist. And, you know, I think that one thing that a lot of people who are either straight or live in the Midwest, um, they don't really, I think, fully appreciate was is that, you know, in the 90s when stuff like Ellen and, and Will and Grace came out, and honestly, I don't like those shows. Like, I think that they're awful stereotypes. And you look back at it, and it's like gross. But in the '90s, it was groundbreaking because it was something where it was allowing a lot of people who may or may not have been very bigoted to allow people to have a queer person come into their household once a week and entertain them and join their family 
and they allowed them to be a part of their family every week. And to a lot of people, it showed them, hey, gay people are not going to come in and they're not going to molest my children. They're not going to murder my family. They're not evil, disgusting, you know, sodomites. They're just regular old people just like me and you. But the thing is that video games have never had that moment. We've never had experiences where you get to meet queer characters. And I mean, and I say that, but even now, like that's changing very quickly, actually. You look at Bill or you look at, at uh, Ellie from Last of Us, and there are now characters that are multifaceted characters that are queer. That doesn't really matter that Bill was gay. I mean, at the end of the day, he could have been a woman. Like, he could have been straight. But he just happened to be gay because that's the way the world is. Just, people just happen to like who they like. And that honestly, that, that usually doesn't actually affect most things. And that's going to be the way it is in our game where 95% of the time it's going to have no you know, you know, interaction with the story whatsoever. Maybe some characters may have some interesting relationships or triangles or this or that with other characters in the game. And, you know, you might have to kind of figure that out. Um, but, you know, we want it to be kind of like real life in that sense where, for the most part, their gender or sexual identity really not going to come into play. But sometimes it does. Um, but for the most part, I mean, you're on, a, you're on like an investigation. It really shouldn't matter. Um, but you never know. I mean, like some people are, they're motivated by different things. And, you know, some people, I'm, tr I'm trying to like really weirdly walk around some spoilers here. Um, th there's, there's kind of some puzzles and stuff that, that are about kind of understanding who the player, who the, the characters that you're talking to are, just kind of understanding their motives. So that way you can know how to approach them and what, what might set them off or what might make them want to talk to you more. Um, and so it's a lot of it is like kind of a learning exercise, uh, but instead of just learning about this character, it's also kind of, I think a good way for people to understand a gay character or a queer character and definitely not representative of the, of that entire spectrum for sure, but just meet one. And if you're a young person, you've never get met a gay person. You'd be like, Oh, okay. Like they're just, that guy's a fucking barkeep, whatever. Like there's, it's, there's nothing special about him and there's, there's nothing not, you know, just, just some guy and, and he has a husband or whatever. Cool. Great. Whatever. I mean, and, and that should be the, at the end of the day, what it is, it should just be like, whatever, who gives a shit. <laughs> and I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that a lot of really educated people like yourself feel the same way where it's like, 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 let's just get on. Like, like we should just be able to move on and be like, Hey, like this, it shouldn't be an issue. It should just be like, everything should be represented and, and people should just like live and let live and if it's not hurting anybody and like everybody's happy um but a lot of people don't feel that way and a lot of young people are, live in very ignorant households or their parents tell them that if they if they ever came out to them that they would they would disown them or they'd kick them out of the house and they they form very very strong opinions towards gays or women or that and um it's important that we as a medium provide a counterbalance to that now, one, one thing I've learned is that being, you know, a privileged, white, straight, cis dude is that basically I've been catered to my whole life. And it's possible that I might see those times when I'm not being catered to as being some sort of great injustice. So I'm aware that there are tons and tons of grizzled old white dudes who are protagonists in video games. And you're saying that it's important for gay gamers to see themselves represented in games, too. But there's probably going to be somebody out there who's saying that, oh, video games are supposed to be about escapism. So can't you just pretend you're straight when you play this game? Yeah, you can. And, and we have for the last 30 years. I think in the same way, you should be able to. And, you know, and there's definitely like, you know, I know that whenever I play a game and it's a lead female protagonist, which is very rare, I feel weird. And it's not because I don't want to play as a female protagonist. It's because I've been taught from video games that that is a weird deviation from the norm. And in the same way as, like, I mean, I was going to say when you play as a gay lead character, but there is none. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something where, like, it, you're just kind of taught from the beginning. It's like, this is just what to expect. Like, you just play as a white dude. Like, hello. Um, but in the same way, like, as, you know, I think that, that, that you know, a lot of people say, hey, why, don't, why can't you just escape into that character? Why can't you just escape into that character? Why can't you pretend to be a gay dude for one game and just, you know, live that, like live in that shoes for a minute, like experience it, enjoy it. It's not, no one's going to like, like 
I guarantee you that if you're ever playing Dragon Age, no one's going to force you to watch a gay sex scene. Like, that'll never happen, you know? <laughs> and, like, all these things, are like, like, like uh, these things that people are so afraid of, like, it's, it's not going to happen. Like, by, by playing it, you'll actually understand that a lot of these people's lives are, are just like yours. They have the same insecurities, same worries, the same feelings. They're just like you and me. In the same way as back in the 60s, people treated people from other races as different fucking creatures because they were ignorant and they didn't understand. And we taught them, and now they understand. And now people, I can't say that racism's dead, but it's a lot better than it was back in the 60s. And before that, we treated, like, if you were Irish, then you couldn't come into my town. Or, 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 you know, and it's just... Every every fifty years we come up with a new you know thing to be ignorant about and we drop the old stuff, and you know it's about time that we drop the gender and sexuality stuff and I'm sure we'll come up with new stuff that will have you know reasonable debates where it's like hey I don't want my son dating a robot cool you know because that's gonna happen <laughs> and just just like you know like there there will always be new things to be ignorant and insecure about but I think that right now. There's there's really no reason why gaming, especially people who want to see gaming, be treated as the like leading like platform for for you know ideas and stories. And it is because you look at movies and TV. That's a passive experience. And you play games, and that's an active experience. Where you're immersed and you're playing as that character. There's no greater immersion than playing a video game. And to have no stories that explore any of these issues. And you have all these great movies that do, is is bizarre and weird. I mean, like you look at a, at, at a movie like like uh, um, Silence of the Lambs, like ninety one, and you know they have a really kind of just a lot of weird stuff in there, a lot of really interesting characters, and they explore stuff. Like they even talk about how the the killer is not trans. He's just there's like there's something like there's a big big diff. There's a a big there's a very big difference between kind of how the killer was acting and and what a trans person is, and they actually talk about it in the movie. And it's 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 fair, I think it makes her a very fascinating character. And in part of I think that's part of what makes the movie awesome. While Hannibal was shit, it was because you know it was really awesome and, and and pushed a lot of weird buttons and talked about it. And gaming we don't, and we we were like we we're just barely even just like tiptoeing towards it. And I would love to see you know more. Triple A titles really explore it. Where, you know, it, I don't know if you played Persona Four, um, but in Persona Four, your main character, well, you you go into the psyches of different people, and basically you help them work through whatever is like their big de inner demon. So someone who's like this really beautiful girl, she's like, oh well, no, like I, I'm nobody, like I'm just my looks, and I have nothing, like no one, I have nothing else, and she just thinks that she's worthless. Uh, but then you meet this gay guy who's like basically closeted and you go into his, his, his mind, you find out that he's gay, he likes other guys, but the resolution of the story was that he was just being immature and he was just afraid of women. And then you help him come out, like snap out of it. And that's because it was written by a Japanese company. And the thing is that even though that's terribly handled and the way they handle the trans character in that is even worse, but at the end of the day, it's still a good thing. Because even though it was horribly written, it was a chance to at least have those characters be present in a game and have those discussions. And for I know so many gay people that, that love Kanji from Persona 4. And that's like their favorite character. And they play as him all the time in Persona 4, fighting uh, Ultimax or no, whatever one's currently out right now, Arena. And you know that he's their favorite character in Persona 4 because there is no other gay characters that they can play as. And it just like it's it's sad that like they have to default to the only ones that are available, and you know there should be like a swath of them in the same way there should be a swath of female you know like lead characters like besides uh, Mira's Edge and Lara Croft and maybe Bayonetta it's like I'm having trouble even just thinking of games that are just single female lead games, and for you know an industry that pumps out hundreds of games a year it shouldn't be five or six women, you know I'm not it doesn't have to be fifty percent I mean it should but it doesn't have to be. Should be more than five. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere. Yeah. Than that. No, and, and other media are having similar issues. I mean, I just last year became aware of the Bechdel test, and now I can't help but apply it to every movie I see. And I'm just astonished at how many movies fail this very basic test. Yeah, it's 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 crazy, and it's one of those things where you know I think that 
it's a lot of it is not um intended you know like i don't i don't think that most people are sexist by nature or they're not like intending to hold people down intentionally they just see it as that's just the way it's always been done and you know like that's the way that you write a character and you can't have a strong female lead that doesn't sell or whatever and so they're just not and the, so the people at the top are, are afraid to make those those you know chances and then we kind of have a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's like well if you are going to pussyfoot into things or you you know when you do have a female lead they're like like you know like this like Catwoman, and you just write it like just this just awful awful script like imagine if Catwoman was written and directed by Christopher Nolan. That movie would be fucking awesome. Catwoman is an awesome character. Instead, it was played by Halle Berry, who played stripper Catwoman, and it was just crap. Like, it was like the story was crap. There was nothing to it. So, of course, like, people are going to not treat them as serious. You look at female, like, like uh, I don't know if you watch WWE, but WWE, all the male wrestlers have, re- like, they have full names, and they have very, like, not very, I wouldn't say very fleshed out characters, but they have fleshed out characters. All the women, they have one name. It's just Paige or Emma. Or this girl. They'd never have full names and their matches are like two minutes long. And then they wonder why nobody cares about the women's matches. It's not because they can't get into it. Like it's not like the women aren't good athletes, it's because they don't even give them a chance. And I think that's like the problem is like, yeah, you, like it's scary and you may lose some money, might not work out, but you should have I don't want to say the balls, you should have the but generally these conversations are run by men, so they should have the balls to go out there and try to actually like include women and queer people into their stories and take a chance because I mean it's at this at this point it's just a matter of time and you might as well be on the winning side of history anyways. And so you mentioned like, that you mentioned that other media is doing a better job of exploring these issues and telling these stories than interactive media is, but at the same time is there still a space for games that don't have to explore those issues? I mean, can we have a game that doesn't tell a story about sexuality like Mario Kart or tells a different story other than sex, like with Papers, Please, where as far as I know, that doesn't really come into play? Oh, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think that, like, it it's definitely not an all or nothing type of situation. And I, I think that's where a lot of people can get, um, I think, a bit kind of like oh defensive where it's like well i don't want you know like so you know we talk about it like well where does where does sexuality fall into mario or where does it fall into this or that and in a lot of cases like well it really wouldn't i mean yeah maybe maybe mario could be chasing after a dude but like at the end of the day like who cares and like that would be kind of trashing on a classic like you don't, you don't need to change it but you know there's a lot of games especially when it comes to story driven games rpgs or things like that or even just like um, there's this one really great game called um, Valkyria Chronicles for the PS3, where you know you command an army and this is really cool like stuff. But you have to, to, to you know choose your team. And there's a couple characters on your team that are like either gay or bisexual, and they get like weird stat status boosts by like being around like guys that they think are cute. In the same way, if they're straight, like if they think a girl's cute, like they'll be like you know there's like a weird kind of like system like that. And it's just really interesting because there's like a very like all the characters have unique personalities. And make them who they are, and they're fun, and none of the gay or queer people like that's not just who they are. They actually they actually have a whole bunch of other characteristics, but that's just part of who they are. Um, and I think even in the same way with Papers Please, I mean, you know, there are like no matter what, like there were queer people, like whether it's the the in the forties or then or whatever, there were queer people. It just happened to be that the time period that they're emulating in that story is a time when being out is basically like the death sentence kind of thing. So you don't, you know, that's why you get like the luscious ladies kind of flyer and things like that. And I'm not saying they need to interject queer content into that. Like the point of, of, you know, if they were to make papers, please in 30 years from now, and it was supposed to be a contemporary look in things, I would hope it would have like some sort of queer like element to it because queer people exist. But for the time period that they're emulating, and the story that they're trying to tell and the emotions that they're trying to get the player to feel, I think that having queer content in that would absolutely be de- detrimental to the actual, you know, like the the power struggle that they're trying to give the player and, and make them feel. And you don't honestly want to imp- bombard them with other thoughts right now. You want to get them to feel like, shit, do I need, like, am I, should I work faster? Like, do I want to take care of my family? Or like, is this the right thing to do? That's what they should be thinking about in that game. So yeah, I think that, that any kind of, sexual or gender kind of stuff in that um it could potentially take away from it but then at the same time 
you'll see characters that will claim that they are male or female, and then you'll do the X-ray scan, and they'll have, uh, you know, like there actually is gender discussions kind of in that game. They're very subtle, where you know someone you'll, you'll be like, oh, someone will look male, or they'll look female, and it'll say male, you know, male or female on the on their identity, and you'll be like, that's wrong. You do the X-ray, and it's actually, you know, they do have whatever. Uh, and it's interesting because they are talking about gender roles there. It's like, oh, just because this person's dressed up one way, you just assume that they are male or female. So there actually is a little bit of discussion about gender and, and not necessarily sexuality, but definitely gender identity in that game. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about read only memories. When can we look forward to playing it and on what systems? Sure. So read only memories is, um, basically if you've never played, uh, uh, yeah, if you've never played Snatcher and you always wanted to play Snatcher, this game is basically Snatcher 2, where I grew up playing Snatcher. It was my favorite game growing up. It felt like, you know, it was a game that came out in like 90, well, the original game came out in like 88, but the Sega CD version came out in 93, and it was a game that just, just blew me away with the music and the story and how graphic it was and just how deep the story was for a game from 1993. And and we and I always wanted to see a sequel, and Konami kind of got like locked Kojima away to make Metal Gears for the rest of his life, and so we'll never see a Snatcher two. Um, and so that was part of like you know we really wanted to see a sequel to that. We really wanted to see more point and click adventure games. Like I was a huge fan of stuff like Police Quest and Gabriel Knight and old Sierra on online games, you know Sam and Max, this or whatever. I want to see more of that. So. We wanted to make a game that emulates kind of that old school look, use, feel, you know, whatever uh, atmosphere that nothing, there's nothing wrong with the Telltale games, but that's a different way of looking at it. And I kind of like the old school 90s style of going through adventure games. We definitely found some conventions that didn't work from back then and we ditched them. But the feel and like the kind of like looking at stuff and using stuff and using things that you shouldn't use just to get funny kind of weird, you know, feedback back. Just, you know, just like stuff like that. Um, we wanted to make this game because it's a kind of adventure game that you can play at your own pace and choose how how deep you want to go. It, it makes it a very natural fit to have a lot of queer content in it because if you are going through it, you don't have to really actually experience any of it. If you just are very kind of on the surface level and you're just going through the plot of the game, which involves you know your your friend going missing and he works for a company that's basically Google in the future and he built this this uh, sapient robot called Turing, which you know just arrives at your house, and you have to kind of figure out the mystery behind your missing friend. Did he get murdered? Is he is he missed? You know, kidnapped? Who's this 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 robot? Like, what is this robot important because he's sapient? Um, and kind of all this the stuff behind it. None of that has any kind of sexual context or or even subtext at all. But all the characters that you meet and the characters that will help you along your journey, they all have individual backstories. They all have things that motivate them. And you'll find that out if you if you take the time to meet with them. But if you know what to do and you're just like, okay, get this item, boop, 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 and you just skip over that, yeah, you won't even see any of that. Um, but we wanted it to, you know, like the main plot to be like high high tension, high plot, which is like, okay, you know, make like getting to the bottom of this thing, figuring out what the like what this company's up to, figuring out, you know, there's like is this is because you know, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but like there's a lot of different shady organizations, there's there's, there's organizations that you think are good but may have some extremist levels to it. There's a lot of politics that we talk about kind of around the city of San Francisco um, where we're kind of um, talking – because the game takes place 50 years in the future, we look at a lot of the fears of the lack of privacy that it will come about, um, the fears of there basically being 10 or so mega corporations that own every major technology and what that looks like. Um, as well as the extreme gentrification of San Francisco. So a lot of the game actually has a very San Francisco vibe of like what's going on right now, as well as if you've never been to San Francisco, we wanted the game to be kind of a love letter to that where you're going to be going to Golden Gate Park and to Chinatown and to all the different kind of major tourist spots of San Francisco. And in the same way that Gabriel Knight, when by the time you leave it, you feel like I understand New Orleans a little bit better. We, we've mixed a lot of history into into this game, and like the history of San Francisco and why these things exist and how they, you know, might change in 50 years. Um, so it's a mix of, you know, old school adventure, San Francisco travel and, and, and talking about current politics, 
as well as meeting really unique, interesting characters, diverse storylines and genders and sexualities, and uh, all wrapped up in a weird kind of neo-punky, late 80s style art and music direction. Excellent. And that is coming out for, is it PC and Mac? Uh, yeah, so it's coming out uh, in November um, for PC, Mac, and Ouya. And then in early 2014, 2015, early 2015, it'll be coming out for iOS, Android, and either, depending on, on how these conversations go, uh, it's going to be coming out for one of the home console systems. Uh, might be on Xbox One, might be on PlayStation, might even be on the Wii U. But you never know. Um, but we're having some really awesome conversations with um, some bigger companies, and um, so, you know, uh, you'll definitely see it in, in other forms uh, in 2015. Um, and but by that time, there will also probably be some extra new stories added in, some extra like you know, we, we definitely have some. I hate the word DLC, but there's going to be other chapters that will come out later on, and then you'll you'll, you'll get to explore other parts of the city outside the main quest. Excellent. Well, I look forward to playing it. And thank you so much for telling us about that game um, and everything else that's going on in the industry. As I've mentioned to you and as I heard in my panel at PAX East, there are just so many topics and issues at play here that a lot of people don't think about, not because they're ignoring it, but just because they've never had the occasion for those neurons to fire. And I appreciate you, you know, patiently answering some of my questions, some of which I'm sure you've heard before. No, I mean, I appreciate you for, for wanting to, to chat about it. I mean, like that's at the end of the day, like what it's going to take for, for things to get better is that people like me can shout and yell from the top of rooftops of what we want. But if people don't want to take an active, um, you know, uh, an active stance and wanting to learn and kind of like figure out, okay, like what can we do here to make it better for everyone? Like, like what you're doing, I think that it's, it's tough to, you, you can't force people to change. People have to want to change on their own. And I think that when people see like, yeah, you know what? This is a little fucked up. And I think that if we all talk about it, we can probably come up with something a little bit better. I think that's when, you know, we see some actual real, maybe slow, but we see progress towards a better world for everybody. So I'm really glad that, that you're doing this and that you're supporting uh, the kind of a diverse culture around gaming. Well, you're doing a lot more by putting on GamerX. Now remind us, that runs July 10th to the 13th in San Francisco. As this show airs, today is July 9th, which means the show starts tomorrow evening. Is it too late for people to sign up to go? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, if they actually use um, GameBits, right, is that, would, that, would that be a good quote? If they use GameBits, they'll actually get $20 off. If, if there are tickets still available on the 9th, so if you go to uh, GamerX.com, there's a registration link and – you can use Game Biscuit 20 bucks off, so only 50 bucks for the weekend. And even if you're not queer, you're going to have an awesome time. You know, we have, like I said, you know, we have BioWare and, and NAS America and 2K and Unity and Ubisoft, all these awesome companies that are going to be there. We have panels from Joystick. We have panels from GameSpot, Anita Sarkeesian. We have WWE's Darren Young. We got uh, the creator of Dogecoin. We got the, the co-founder of Reddit, Alexis Ohanian. The creator of the second largest web comic in the world, SNBC Comics, Zach Wienersmith. All these amazing fucking people. Most of them are actually just straight awesome people who want to see change just like you. So if you come, you'll have an awesome time. You're surrounded by a ton of really awesome, cool people. You'll probably learn a little bit. So uh, go to GamerX, that's G-A-Y-M-E-R-X dot com. And if you enter Game Bits, you get 20 bucks off. Thank you, sir. That's very generous. Now remind our viewers where they can find you online. Uh, I am on Twitter. I'm at Matt Conn, Matt M-A-T-T-C-O-N-N. Um, you can also find uh, GamerX on Twitter, at GamerX. And then our game studio is uh, at We Are Midboss. We Are Midboss, like Midboss, like uh, in from Disgaea. And then our Instagram is We Are Midboss. And then you can also find us on uh, Facebook, Matt Conn, GamerX, uh, Midboss on Facebook. Excellent, sir. Well, thank you so much for your time, and good luck with GamerX. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate you having us on. <laughs>